So, um, I've been asked to speak about um, the question of why international law matters in the struggle for justice in Israel and Palestine and how it can be used in campaigns like ICADS. So what I want to start with is really the question of what is the importance of international law to this conflict, to this struggle. And it's instructive, I think, to start with a quote um, by Tipi Livni, former foreign minister, to um, Palestinian negotiators at the Annapolis conference in 2007. Uh, and this is what she reportedly said to the, to the Palestinian side who were trying to introduce international law as a term of reference for the negotiations. And I quote, she said the following, I was a minister of justice. I am a lawyer, but I am against law. International law in particular, law in general. So I think what she was getting at is something which is, which is very self-evidently the case for those of you who are familiar with international law, which is that it's mainly on the side of the Palestinian struggle. It contains principles that really underpin um, the Palestinian cause, and which also, in my view, support a vision for justice and human rights for both Palestinians and Israelis, in fact, um, regardless of whatever kind of political solution one might espouse. And so I think, in a sense, that's really you know, international law's most important role. And I think um, it's worth restating some of the basic principles that, that are supportive of, of the Palestinian cause, just for those of you who may not be familiar with them. First of all, we know that in, as part of general international law, and this is reflected in UN resolutions, it's reflected in an international court of justice opinion in 2004, that Israel has no rightful claim to sovereignty over the West Bank, including importantly the East Jerusalem or Gaza, and Palestinians have a right to self-determination in those territories. Now, I think that is actually a very important principle, and, and it's not something that can be overlooked in light of Israel's territorial ambitions, in light of its relentless colonization of these territories. Um, and it also, of course, means that Palestinians have a right to self-determination, a right to, this, to a state in these territories. That's not something that's conditional on the outcome of a peaceful process. So I think that's very important. Another important set of principles is that, of course, many of the rules of international law, especially international human rights law, apply not only to the West Bank and Gaza, but they apply to regulate Israel's behavior within its own territory and towards other Palestinian constituencies. So notably, the Palestinian refugees have a right to return to their homes in Israel, and the Palestinian citizens of Israel have a right to live in the country in, with full human rights and full equality. But I've, I've posed the question, why does international law matter? Because I think, in a sense, the answer is also not entirely straightforward. So whilst it contains all of these principles, which are very supportive to the struggle for justice and so on, at the same time, we're faced with a situation where, as we know, Israel essentially completely ignores international law. Um, and there is no kind of general um, global enforcement mechanism for, for the law. It depends on Israel either voluntarily submitting to the law or to the political will of states to enforce the law through, for example, the UN Security Council. Um, and because of the lack of that political will, we, we live in a situation in which the law is largely unenforced. And so I think skeptics might well say, and many people do approach me and say, in those circumstances, the law doesn't really have a role. It you know, doesn't act as a mechanism of redress for those whose rights have been abused. And however much we invoke it, it just doesn't change the situation on the ground. So I think the real question becomes, what is the role of international law given this lack of enforcement? You know, does it still have a role? Does it still matter? Um, and my answer to that question is yes. I think it still can play a very important role and it, and it can and should be harnessed in, in support of our campaigns. And what I want to spend the rest of the time doing is outlining the three main roles that I think there are for, there is for international law in spite of its lack of enforcement. So, the first role, to my mind, is what I call um, the role of law in helping us win the legitimacy war. Now, what I mean by this is that I think for better or for worse, um, we live in a world today where those in a conflict or those political activists who are seen to be abiding by international law whose claims are underpinned by the law, tend to occupy the moral high ground in world public opinion. 
And so being able to articulate one's positions, one's claims in a language of law and human rights um, essentially wins, wins moral legitimacy and wins over public opinion to those positions and to those campaigns. And therefore helps win what Richard Falk, I think it was he who first termed the phrase, calls the legitimacy war. And what he meant by that is the kind of struggle or the battle that's, been t that's taking place in the court of public opinion um, today, in which Palestinians are really um, striving to, and in fact largely succeeding in, persuading the world that they have a just struggle, that their struggle is one that's against occupation, against colonialism, against apartheid, and Israel is kind of pushing back against this by asserting that it's a, in fact a democratic state and it's taking steps you know, against terrorism and against militancy. And I think we see many examples of the role of law in this so-called legitimacy war. So for example, one, one a, striking, a, a striking instance of this for me was the coverage of the Gaza war last summer, if you remember for those of you who were who in this country at the time. It was really um, dominated by questions which were ultimately legal questions. You know, were, were, were Israel's operations proportionate? Were Hamas committing war crimes by sending rockets over? Um, and I think that public opinion about that assault was quite largely influenced, actually, by the perception of who seemed to be the main war criminal in that, in that war and that operation. Um, and I think Israel very much came out the loser in that respect. Um, and we see it in, in other cases as well. So some of you will be familiar with the so-called universal jurisdiction cases. Those are the attempts um, to bring prosecutions against foreign leaders in, in other countries, especially in European countries. Now, none of those cases um, have led yet to a, actually a prosecution. But in a sense, you know, it, ha it hasn't really mattered because I think those cases have been very important in, in showcasing um, Israeli violations <coughs> Um, and then really advertising the fact that Israel is committing crimes and that its leaders are essentially sort of becoming war criminals on, on the run from the law. And for anyone who's in doubt about the importance of the role of the law in this respect, one only needs to look really at the Israeli reaction to the Palestinian use of the law. And we know in 2010 that uh, the former Deputy Foreign Minister of Israel actually defined as a foreign policy priority for Israel over the next decade combating these legal cases that are brought by Palestinians. And you know, we see sort of Israel using every sort of lever of pressure um, available to it to thwart any kind of legal initiatives before they begin. So for example, at the moment, you know, Israel's been running a, a sustained campaign to discredit the Commission of Inquiry report, which we're expecting next month. That's a, a UN report into the Gaza war last summer. They've already forced um, William Shabas, who was the head of the commission, to resign. Um, they, you see in the formidable opposition that Israel has put up to Palestine joining the International Criminal Court. I mean, absolutely extraordinary measures it's gone to, like freezing tax revenue for three months, amounting, as we know, to millions and millions of dollars and the like. So, you know, I think that we can't really understate the importance of the law in this regard. Uh, and what, what, you know, the way I'd sum it up is to say that when you are the weaker party militarily um, in a conflict, you, you're going to have to rely on other mechanisms of pressure, popular pressure, non-violent resistance and so on. And I see the law as an important tool, really, um, in, in that kind of non-violent sort of resistance. Um, it's a tool for articulating a case uh, and for winning over public opinion to it, and therefore potentially in the long run, helping to shift the balance of power. Okay, so I've, I've talked about that a lot, and that is what I'd say is the first role of the law. Um, the second role, I think, the second importance for international law is that in addition to helping articulate one's, one's case, I think it also, to a certain extent, helps define what it is that we're actually struggling for. You know, what are our objectives, and what is our approach to achieving a resolution? And, and what I mean by that is, if we pursue a struggle that's underpinned by international law, then what we're in effect doing um, is we are adopting an approach that puts the concept of rights, of universal human rights, at its heart, rather than, for example, an approach that puts political outcomes at its heart. Um, in the sense that the law, especially international human rights law, is really about ensuring that people have rights, 
So in, in a kind of broad sense, I think international law approach means that our, our objectives are necessarily just in a way, or they're necessarily objectives that, that prioritize universal human rights and other kinds of you know, um, values, I think, that we would espouse. I think that the law also helps us define the way we look at this conflict um, and the way we therefore think about going about resolving it. So what I mean by this, I want to give a couple of examples. Um, I think if we look at things through a legal sort of prism, we add um, a context or a frame around this conflict by, for example, allowing us to define it as a situation in which there is occupation, a situation in which there is colonialism, or a situation in which there is apartheid. And in so doing, we get away from the kind of competing narratives idea, which uh, I think those on the other side often try to sort of promote, which is the idea that there's no real truth, there's just kind of competing narratives and, and it's all relative, and that there's a balance or a sort of moral equivalence between the two sides. But by contrast, a legal approach would perhaps say, for instance, here we have a colonial situation. That means we have colonized a coloniser, and the solution in those circumstances is decolonization, as opposed to, for example, endless negotiation, which is what we've seen up until now. So I think you know, viewing things in that way gives us a sort of roadmap for a true roadmap for how to resolve the situation. Um, another example is that I think the interna international law approach counteracts an idea that has largely been the, uh, underpinned the political process up until now, which is the idea that Palestinian rights are somehow conditional. So there's an idea that Palestinians have to sort of prove their peaceworthiness before they're allowed to get their lands back, or they have to prove that they're not a security threat to Israel before Israel has to end the occupation. Um, and I think this is unfair because it's provided Israel with cover to continue the occupation kind of indefinitely and therefore for conflict to continue indefinitely. But by contrast, international law would define a regime or a set of practices as, as unlawful and the solution would then be that those practices or that regime has to be brought to an end without conditions. <coughs> so you can, you can see the difference there. Um, and finally, I'd say international law is, is really important for true reconciliation in the sense that it allows us to define certain actions and certain policies as unlawful. And that means that we can acknowledge the reality, which is that wrongs have happened, that people's rights have been abused. And I think this is really a prerequisite for achieving a genuine reconciliation in a sense in the long run between the peoples. Because I think if you skip that stage, you know, we've, we've seen what happened in other, in other conflicts, you don't get a true reconciliation and, and conflict kind of continues indefinitely. So that's what I'd say about the law, see, the usefulness of the law and also helping us define our objectives and our approach to conflict resolution. Um, and if I have time, I'd like to just turn to the third sort of value of the law, which is what I'd say is the law's role in providing redress. Now, I've, I've said at the start that international law is largely unenforced and largely unenforceable and um, because of power politics in the world today. I would just modify that position slightly by saying that in a sense, if we keep, however, bringing cases and legal challenges, and particularly if we keep doing those in, in domestic jurisdictions, foreign domestic jurisdictions, rather than in international jurisdictions, I do think it's only a matter of time before one of these cases kind of sticks, as it were, and we do achieve accountability, at least in a, in a limited sense, with respect to uh, one case or a handful of cases. And I say this because the universal jurisdiction prosecutions that I mentioned although until now unsuccessful, have in some cases got very, very close. So we've had criminal investigations opened, we've had arrest warrants issued, and I think that over time, national prosecutors and courts are really getting to grips with the notion that Israel is a systematic abuser of human rights. And when these cases are brought before them, they are going to be more inclined as time goes along to eventually allow one to go ahead. And I think in that regard, another forum very much worth pursuing and supporting is that of the International Criminal Court. Now, it's riddled with, with difficulties and I don't have time to go into it, but um, I think at the very least, we have an independent prosecutor who has stated her commitment to dealing with the Palestine situation impartially. Um, and, you know, even if a prosecution doesn't get off the ground, if she were to open an investigation into certain Israeli crimes, particularly into settlement construction, 
I think that could have some quite interesting legal by sort of side effects, particularly in the way that national jurisdictions who've signed up to the ICC, as many of them have, like all of the EU countries, for example, might then have to deal with corporations or other entities within their own jurisdictions that have dealings with settlements. So, you know, what I'm saying is, you know, cases in national, foreign national jurisdictions and the ICC, I still think it's worth pursuing these avenues and we may well find that there are op some opportunities for limited legal redress if we continue to pursue them. So that's really what I wanted to say about the role of international law. Now, I suspect I don't really have time to go into specific cases and specific avenues that might support our campaigns. Um, but if anyone's interested, it's, I'm happy to come back to that in the questions. Um, what I would say really is I'd emphasize this notion of looking at legal challenges that can be brought in national jurisdictions. And there are many, and they're not just criminal cases. We can look at civil cases, we can look at cases against charitable associations that are involved with the occupation and the like. Um, and in conclusion, really, you know, what I'd say is that I think just to keep at the forefront of our minds going forward, um, that it's important to engage with the law as one of the tools, really, in our toolbox for advocacy and for helping to apply pressure on Israel. And that I think we should also ensure that, the, that international law principles um, play a central role in kind of underpinning our objectives and defining the parameters of our, of our campaigns and of our political movements. So thank you very much.